This interview with Steve Hackett is brought to you by Make a Difference with Records. We are a vinyl charity store based in Godalming and we support the Surrey mental health charity Catalyst. Look out for our other podcasts and you can follow us on Instagram under Make a Difference with Records or on Twitter at Vinyl for Charity. So my name's Anthony from Make a Difference with Records and I'm lucky enough today to be here with Steve Hackett. Steve, thanks for having me along today. Nice to talk to you, Anthony. All the best. Thank you. So, um, preparing for this interview was more difficult than I thought because I followed your career since what the mid well, in fact, since your solo career began, uh, having first got into Genesis with Trick of the Tail, um, and then I kind of reminded myself, well, I'm not here as a fan today. I'm here on behalf of Make a Difference with Records, right. and I was therefore thinking, well, actually. What would be the most appropriate thing to talk to you about? Also recognising that you, you're you very accessible as a musician. You've done a lot of interviews. And I know you get asked the usual questions about leaving Genesis and all that kind of stuff. But I, I wanted to start today talking a little bit about your book, um, mm. A Genesis in My Bed, because mm. a lot's been written about you. Um, but when I read the book, the one thing that struck me is that you don't just confine it, obviously, to your musical career. There's a lot of a story about you as an individual and your own personal journey through someone who grew into confidence in the band, Foxtrot Selling England, then solo career, rebuilding confidence, and so on and so forth. What made you want to tell that part of your story? Um, well, you know, most autobiographies to, do tend to... Um, obviously, it all starts young born at a very young age and all the rest and then people um, become more successful and then it becomes a who's who of who they, whoever they've worked with etc mm. no, I, I was out last evening with Madonna darling and um, <laughs> and it was truly scrumptious is, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no it wasn't I'd say most people you know, heading towards that and, and, and then it becomes a who's who and, and funny enough it was Joe who said to me yeah, it normally just ends up with you know this kind of uh, you know a who's who and, and a kind of you know oh, yes wouldn't I like to have that address book yes you know Winston Churchill followed by etc 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 and um, um, I thought there are other things that motivate me and I, and I like to think that there is a life outside music and it's probably got to do with well in in a way it's got to do with music and and, and the purpose of music and and what is what is the subtext of music if it exists at all why do people listen to music and it's yes in order to feel to feel better to be re-energized um to feel at one with whoever you're listening with yeah. and I always thought that you know music was it was a shared experience. It certainly was when I was a kid. You know, um, right from very young, we were sharing records, and and, and that's in 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 a pre sort of iPod kind of yeah. era where people listen to music separately and they go for a run and they do all this mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. this 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 sort of thing. But music wasn't like a pill that you took separately in the morning and. Um, and then you then you put it away. M music was this this shared thing, and again, this idea of the subtext of it, yes, to re-energize, make people feel better. Your relationship with Joe yeah. and what that means to both of you mm. comes out really, really strongly. And anyone that's not yet read the book, I don't yeah. think this is a plot spoiler, but it's a ha very right. happy en ending. But what I wanted oh, to ask yes. you um, was if we wind the clock back a bit. Sure. And we go back to probably one of your darker periods, so mm. 2007 to 2009. Yeah, yeah. And um, I wanted to ask you in particular about the album Out of the Tunnel's Mouth, which yes. is one of my favourites. Right, yes. Um, came out in 2009. Yes. I think at the time, you know, you were in a flat on your own. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. recording it on your own. I mean, what yeah. was that period like and how did the music help you through that time? Um... Well, I believe I'd started it, and at some point I befriended, and Chris Squire and I knew each other, and um, Chris asked me to 
be on an album of his, a Christmas album he was making, and and I, I, I jumped at the chance, you know, because I, I was starting to feel a bit isolated mm -hmm. at that point, and um, so one thing led to, to another. He did some things for me. I did things for him, um, and um, it was very interesting with him. He responded very positively to any idea that was good and very emotionally and, and unlike Genesis where there were a lot of great ideas mm -hmm. kicking around um, there was usually this repressed feeling now maybe that would have been part of the background and um, the schooling that they'd had Charter House where I suspect showing emotion was surplus to requirements yes. a lot of the time yeah. I think when you are um, on one hand brutalized on another raised to rule um, I I think this does mess with the young head anyway Chris had none of that I got the feeling it was very much you know working class background etc Chris was very responsive to ideas and I could see that he was engaged with them and so this was a, a great revalidation for me and so he played on one or two of the solo things and um, and, and we had surplus and we ended up making uh, an album called Squack It, Squire yeah. and Hack It. Yeah. Um, and I had great fun doing that. Uh, again, it, it, it was an album, it was, it was a problem with my studio about the ownership of it was being disputed whilst um, there were various things going on with ex-partners. Yeah. And, and um, so I thought, well, I'll just record at home. I'll just mm -hmm. get on with that and we'll do it in miniature. And Chris said, because you can, and these days that's what you can do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we used amp simulation and, yes. and all all that kind of stuff. And um, it was a great period. It was really done in two halves. Um, first half seemed to be going great guns. And, and then um, um, Chris decided to relocate back to the States where Scotland, his wife, um, although she was born in Scotland, was very much an American. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he uh, relocated to Phoenix. And then when he came back a few times, you know, we, we, we concentrated on finishing the thing. Um, but it was a great experience. It was very different to working with, with anyone else. It seemed to me that, that the way he worked and, and the way we, we, we did together, the team that had Roger King, myself, yep. and, and, and Chris, um, it seemed as if, if we were working on the tune, if anyone had an idea, the song just got longer in order to incorporate mm -hmm. that idea. And so I realised how these many variations on the, on the Yes songs worked, whereas Genesis was much more of a contest this bit is better than this <laughs> bit you know it's not quite you know i'm the king of the castle but <laughs> you know, someone would would say well that's not as strong as this you know and i think we should do this and i think we should do that um and but but it didn't really encapsulate fully what yes. everyone was capable of at that moment in time hugely creative but it just the machinery worked in a different way it wasn't competitive. It was, um, it was cooperative. Yeah. The best of Genesis, of course, is, is immensely cooperative, as you could imagine. Um, but um, you know, this this thing with 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 Chris was a bit of an eye opener to me because I thought, you know, you know, he's this world class player and band leader, and and uh, he works this way. And uh, but uh, Steve, if I could, if I could ask you um, about a couple of tracks in particular. Sure. So far on the moon, which is mm. one of my all-time favourites of yours, and Emerald and Ash, and I picked those yeah. two out because yeah. there's an element of rawness about some of the lyrics on yes. that album. Yes. W was this a cathartic experience for you? Was it your kind of like face value equivalent, or uh, if I well, call it that? It's funny. I hadn't thought about face value, but um, uh, I think you know there are aspects of 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 that. Um, and it, yes, it was cathartic, and I think there's some, I think there's some beauty in there, and there's some strength in there, and there's some delicacy, if I can say that about my own stuff. 
Um, and I also had um, a further link to Genesis, which was Anthony Phillips, who agreed to play on a couple of tracks. Well, he was on Emerald and Ash, wasn't he? He's on Emerald and Ash, yeah. and I think he's on Sleeper as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, so we did, you know, one or two things together and that was very nice because we're friends although we, we've never officially been in Genesis at the same time um, nonetheless I sensed that had we been in Genesis at the same time um, there would have been this totally democratic way of working that yes. um, was common to working with 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 Chris um, I mean I think it's very difficult because you know if you're lucky, uh, a band will have one genius. If if you're lucky enough, like the Beatles, to have arguably three, and George Martin has Beatles number number five, yeah, five and six. <laughs> you, yeah. What am I trying to say here? It's um, it's a crowded place, wasn't it? It is. A, it is a crowded place, uh, and. Um, uh, the pressures can be can be enormous, you, and you, you find yourself trying very very hard to uh, to uh, you know write something of worth and 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 relevance, not just for the band, but something yeah. that might 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 last beyond beyond that. I know we all felt that that pressure, um, and you you knew that each of these guys were capable of leading the charge themselves. Yes, so. Um, Although very different commercial Pro success, as we saw with the solo yeah. project, so yeah, it, it's it's a very strange thing. It doesn't seem to be any accident that each of them had recurrent success, um, which was pretty rare. And and um, a friend, Nigel Pierce, who's who's a, a DJ from Norfolk, um, says he swears he's got a tape of of um, John Lennon. It was uh, an interview that he did in, mm -hmm. in Florida, saying he considered that the Genesis were true sons of the Beatles. Okay, true sons That's of the Beatles. A high compliment. That's a very high compliment. Um, mm. uh, that comes from the top. So, anything that's in that time frame, yeah, um, I consider it to be a very high value indeed, and. Um, uh, I refuse to see it as an abandoned place, and I, I tried my damnedest, and it's not over yet, to you know present the best of what that band is or was capable of. So that's my take on it. Yeah, politics free, just the best music. <laughs> that's the way I see it. So I, I want to ask you a bit about some of that period and Watcher. We'll talk about in a second. Just sure. before, just before we get on to that. Um, out of the tongue's mouth for me sparked a, a run of a string of some very very strong material arguably some of your strongest ever material at what point did you realize you were in a blue period and this was you were really producing something that was going to stand the test of time um well um you could say no one really knows in terms of of audience response or how something's going to do in in the marketplace but but i think that you know the true currency of a song is 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 how much it moves you personally and spiritually and and all the rest is it a real song isn't mm -hmm. it what did you write it for what were the motivations um, does it excite you does it move you in mm -hmm. in whatever way and the moving music doesn't have to be um doesn't have to be tchaikovsky yes although i find that very moving uh it can be it can be heavy metal it can be mm -hmm. um it, again, I quote Joe, we were playing some Deep Purple yesterday in the car, Deep Purple live in Japan. And she said, you know, I so much prefer this, she said, to, um, you know, technically gr driven jazz. She said, I, right. she, she'll say anything that's got some real emotion to it, you know, uh, whether it's folk music with real passion yeah. or, or this proto uh, heavy metal stuff mm -hmm. that's got real passion um fine by her and and of course th there's a world of music in there and different schools to say that but i i think for her it doesn't have to be or or it's better if it's not merely technically competent and i think that a lot of yeah. musicians do fall back on technique 
whoever said that, that musicians often start off with passion and end up with technique is very, <laughs> very, very, very right. Unless you're displaying your technique for all it's worth and you're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not just doing it because, because you can, but because those salvos um, relate to your 18-year-old self. Yes. When, when you were a kid. You know, I had this feeling that when I was listening to um, a Surfing with the Alien, that that I thought, yeah, this feels like what I used to do in my bedroom mm -hmm. when I was 18. The, yeah. the, these same licks. These, and I understand it, the, the idea of absolutely full on and yeah, um, no holds barred. You're playing to the maximum of your ability flat out on it um it's a fugue in the wider sense of the word of you're in a you're in a spell of yeah. it and and at the end of it yeah it's cathartic as as anything you should be completely exhausted and and gone and i i'm, I'm still very drawn to those aspects of that music can do that although mm -hmm. i realize that jazzers will probably have you know more knowledge of chords and mm -hmm. And um, I think I think it's because when it's acoustic, um, or or if a jazz man is playing with a jazz tone, mm -hmm. it's not screaming. It might not be bending a lot of notes. There might not be a lot of vibrato. It can be extremely fluent, uh, mm. but it's literally going up and down. It proficiency here, proficiency there, but for me. I've got to hold a note and torture it. I've got to, it's got to be that in between. Yeah. You know, the Keystone Cops runs. And I call them salvos because I know that a lot of people do think of, you know, guitars as, as the sort of machine gun yeah. um, equivalent. And I understand that, you know, with the tapping technique. Um, but Steve, if we just stick with the emotional side of it, yes. which, I mean, your technical so, prowess has been evident ever since you know the, the very first album nursery crime wasn't it the first genesis album that, that you did um when you said in your book towards the end you said that you finally felt that you were at home you finally felt that you'd arrived so you talked about the fact you've got this balance now between mm. you know recreating not recreating as in absolutely faithfully recreating but effectively paying homage to if that's the right expression to the, the powerful genesis period that you were yeah. A central yeah. part of and yeah. your solo stuff and you felt that now you've clearly expressing that you've got that balance now yeah when did that suddenly kind of fall into place well it's a funny thing because um these genesis revisited things have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and mm -hmm. tours have been, been getting longer and longer and longer and um and it's been marvelous you know the fact that i was able to do that um but at the same time as I started to do that, um, so the album started to chart again. Yes. And, um, so solo albums um, have been doing very well all over the world. And um, it's a funny thing, isn't it? You know, I suspect promoters want one thing, but fans possibly mm -hmm. want something else. And they say, oh, I you know, wish you were doing more of your solo stuff. So gradually it's getting to the point where just having done the whole of Foxtrot or kicked it off in this country and uh, and done a, a comparably long solo set before it um, uh, the balance was was complete if you like so it's it's lovely for me to know that that um, and both both stack up both against each other incredibly well I mean I the, the reception the reception you get for your solo set yeah I think is as warm and as powerful, certainly Hammersmith was as powerful as it was for the Foxtrot stuff. Obviously, people have got a soft spot. Yes. Foxtrot, because it might have been the first album they got into. But Absolutely, yeah. You know, Shad yeah, Shad the Hierophant yes. never fails to deliver, does it? Well, part of that was written during the Foxtrot sessions. That's the funny thing. So yeah. something about yeah. that year, 72. Um, the magic dust was being Mike, sprinkled, was Mike it? Mike Rutherford. Well, I think so, yeah. And, and it, was, um, it was some wonderful melatronic and therefore orchestral in spirit 
things that were coming out of that that time and um and of course watch of the skies yeah they just the Mellow, the, yes tron which yes. i gather i didn't realize until i read your book that apparently you were the instigator of the mellotron when you went to see king crimson is that right yeah well i'd wanted i was assumed it was tony but it was you that apparently I'd, bought it well I'd, I'd wanted genesis to get a mellotron um and so for the first six months we didn't have one uh, or so it seemed Actually, maybe I've lost count here. January, February, March, April, May, June. Yeah, by by then, um, I'd been banging on about getting a Mellotron. And um, and then Fred Munt, who worked with Charisma, he may have been label boss at that time, said, oh, I've just heard, boys, that um, <coughs> King Crimson is selling one of their Mellotrons. Are you interested? Am I interested? Yes. So Tony and I went, to see Crimson, we were rehearsing in a little cafe off Fulham Palace Road mm -hmm. in the basement in the bowels of the earth, dark, dank place. Um, and they seem to have three Mellotrons dotted around. Well, we've only ever seen two Mellotrons in the flesh. I saw one at Echo Zoo Studios in Bournemouth. Right. And Aunt Phillips, I don't know if you still got it, but Aunt Phillips used to have one in his attic. Right, so this was a Mark II. Uh, the same model that the Beatles used on Strawberry Fields Forever. Okay. Um, and um, straight away, Tony started mixing the strings and the brass together. Um, he hadn't quite incorporated the uh, the bass effect, which, which which was from the left hand uh, manual. The English accordion provided the bass of on that introduction to Watch for the Sky. Um, but you know that sound was being born straight away mm -hmm. uh that mixture of, of, of brass and string Bra the brass is very because the sounds of the melodra are distorted the brass is very it's very full-on it's it's, it's maybe it's very harsh yeah. it's not it's not a dynamic instrument it's either on or it's off but by the time it's um Treated, charted up, as uh, John Acock used to call it, my late great friend. Um, if you tart them up, you get a wonderful sound like like on um, Epitaph, King Crimson's okay. Epitaph. That, that to me sounded wonderfully well recorded and, and well played. And again, I have to mention Ian MacDonald, if, if not for Ian. Mm -hmm. I think you know I wouldn't have been so um, enamoured with you know the properties, the possibilities of of, of the Mellotron. It was it was enormous. I, it's very I, temperamental though on the range, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So and why was that? Was something to do with the technology? Was it? Well, yeah. I mean, it is <coughs> mechanical technology. It's um, things are tapes are are, are are rotating, and they can. Um, lose oxide and um, they, so therefore they distort and, and when they're being carried around you can imagine the condensation yes. factor yeah, can make them distort further and sometimes they will stick and not work at all so um, so were there any disasters in the early Genesis days? Were many, <laughs> many disasters um, and yeah I mean we will be performing to 22,000 people in Rome and I the worst moment was always is the Mellotron going to work the opening note is it going to work yes it did and yep. it sounds glorious yep. and we've made it to the end of the intro without any screw ups and oh yeah sounds a bit like the fourth or fifth intro where everyone in the crowd's holding their breath yes to well, actually good. Roger I've never seen him mess that up but I've seen quite a few tribute bands where it's not Between an a easy, few goes into that one. <laughs> it's not an easy piece to play that at, at that, um, and um, I think you know you, you, your nerves could get the better of you there. It's it's a complex piece, and um, again, you know, we're talking about Tony and and the things that that he did, um, and so I always loved the things that he came up with for Mellotron, uh, Fountain of Samarsis absolutely glorious just mm -hmm. just the keyboard work alone it's worth its weight in gold um many other things um 
bits of the lamb. Um, so many, and and I'm missing out on all sorts of things. Fly on a windshield. Yeah, yeah. And you realise that really, in spirit, Tony was a classical composer, although he might take issue with that. You know, uh, working in a rock band. Well, he's and, done and a number of classical albums, of course, well, he in has, his own he right, has, as a few. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favourite, uh, Metamorphosis, which I absolutely like that. love, um, That Vast Life. Right, yes, wow. that's a, a, long, a long piece. It, it yes. is, but it's got this yes. refrain that just keeps coming back yeah. and then disappearing and coming back. So it's a very moving yeah, piece I, of music. I hoped it would be. I hoped it would be like a, like a life where you always return to... Um, you're always completing the circle, and mm -hmm. it gets reminded every time. And I think life is a bit like that, isn't it? It's like you leave behind so much when yeah. you grow up, yeah. but there's something intrinsically you that remains, um, and occasionally you feel that circle closes. I certainly felt that when we were doing at Hammersmith the other night, and my mother came forward. and Yeah, that was a lovely moment. And it was incredibly moving for me, you know, yeah. um, uh, you know, the, the room just seemed to be filled with so much love and love for the music and, uh, and of course, you know, love between mother and son and the band, you know, very proud of the band, very proud of, of the music, the, the Genesis music and all the other incarnations of bands that built the so-called solo stuff, but they were all different, mm. you know, bands at different times. I mean, you, you've talked about the, we talked a lot about the emotional side of music, yeah. which... You know, when we first met, um, I remember we had a conversation around, we talked about the Beatles, mm. uh, and I said to you that, you know, for me, the Beatles are an amazing group, but didn't move me emotionally. And then we talked about, you know, the time in your life when your emotions are starting to come to the fore. Right, and, yes. And, the, and of course, the, one of the very first albums I heard that really kind of went, wow, was a trick of the tale, so right. it, it's a place in time. Yes, in a sense. Yes. So, yes. so you yeah. recreating? I, I, mm. I shouldn't use the word recreate, but you um, reviving yeah. and putting your own stamp on yeah. um, those early Genesis albums. Yeah. Does it take you back to those moments in time, or not? Um, well, it does, and at the same time, um, I allow it to take me somewhere else. So mm -hmm. that. If we've got additional woodwind or brass, yeah, or an occasional orchestra, um, uh, I, I have this idea that that music should continue to evolve, mm -hmm. maybe in small increments, <laughs> but um, uh, somehow it doesn't have to be slavishly done in the way that, say, for instance, Mellotron. Now. Um, <laughs> Mellotron strings. I did some work for Mellotron um, in, in recent years and I gave them some notes that they could use for the Mellotron, for the, for the new breed of Mellotron. Right, right. And, um, and they said, how do you, you know, how shall we pay you? And I said, would you give me the, uh, the Mellotron strings before they go through the Mellotron? Oh, okay, so, so you've got the input. So... It yeah. was three women in a bedroom somewhere in New York, or New York <laughs> State, in 1953 no. that provided these samples that showed up on everything from, you know, Moody Blues to Michael Jackson. Yeah. And, um, and so there we are, you see. Um, yeah. uh, so we've got the cleanest Mellotron strings in the business. So we mix that with the distorted brass via the the Mellotron. You see, it's a sample of a sample of a sample, yes. all this. And then Roger mixes some model samples with, 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 with that modern sample to smooth it. Yeah. And so when you hear that, I think, magnificent sound that, that comes out, you've got Mellotron Plus. You're hearing that. And I was keen on some extra reverb being put on that as well, so that it never sounded dry, but it yes. was always as symphonic as, you know, a pair of hands can do on On that. Um, I still think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic piece of music, and it's, you know, it's a sci-fi soundtrack 
Mm -hmm. It's a journey. It's a film for the ear. It's all of those things. When when music tells a story and it works that well, mm -hmm. when you're caught up in it, um, as you said, you know, a, a trick of the tale, the idea of, um, you know, dance on a volcano and when you can picture the volcano and when the molten rock yep. does that thing, but the notes become that yep. and, and you're you're painting that picture or you're... You're well, trying for that to, matter, to be honest, entangled, very different. I mean, very yeah. acoustic, but uh, the theme of the lyrics and yeah. the music just goes so well together. Well, I'm glad you like that. It takes you to a place. Yes, yeah. Because um, um, it was really one of your babies, wasn't it? It, it was, entangled. yes. Uh, and um, I remember Phil saying, when I first presented the idea, he said, oh, this, this has got a Mary Poppins feel. I like this. <laughs> Never thought of that. Why as don't Mary we do Poppins? this, Mary Poppins? You know, okay. over the rooftops and houses. Oh, I think oh, okay. I think you'd seen that. Yeah, and, um, yeah. So um, we weren't immune to Disney, or cartoons, or or musicals, or or anything. Um, um, it wasn't just about hogweeds and. It, it, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't just about hogweeds. Um, <clears throat> I think it was about all sorts of things. It was about. The preposterous and, and 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 the obscurantist, but it was also, um, it was also occasionally about love songs. It was certainly about telling stories. It was certainly about humour. There was a bit of panto in there. Willow Farm, Pete dancing about with a, with a flower mask. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's as much Bill and Ben as it is um, high art. Do you know what I mean? I do. Um, so I do. But it worked. Uh, it, it was it worked. all of those things, and I think all the reasons that we loved the Beatles was the sheer breadth yeah. of the work, and yeah. hopefully music should have that. And, and, and pushing, the boundary, have, pushing the boundaries too. Always having to remind myself yeah. that music can be this. You don't just have to be a guitarist. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be yeah, all sorts of things. You could be an arranger, you could be an impresario, you could just be bringing two people together that mm. might do something because you think the idea might be worth pursuing like an idea like uh, the memory of myth on um on uh, uh under a mediterranean sky mm -hmm. um the lovely string theme on that joe wrote and roger um orchestrated it and i just sat back and i thought wow wonderful one of those moments one of those and you moments. know you've got something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and so I'm sort of midwife to that, not 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 the mother <laughs> or the father. That's a lovely description. Yeah, midwife. I think sometimes yeah. to be the glue or to be the midwife, yeah. or just the right word at a certain point it can be important. as effective. Yeah. I think that was my. You see, I'd seen the way that that, that um, Pete Simfield had operated with King Crimson, and I guess it's because it seemed as if he noticed all the things that no one else had time to notice because yeah. they were too busy playing the parts but somebody who stands back and says oh yes well live we can perhaps stick these drums through a um through a little or oh, say <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> through through a ring modulator and yeah. see what that produces yeah ah oh, yeah well yeah why not you know and that's not usually something that a drummer's going to think of yeah. unless yeah. maybe he did ian wallace at the time but i remember seeing him at the fairfields hall and thinking, well, that's not a usual drum solo, is it? Yes. It's being treated. And um, and I noticed when he was talking to to John Wetton, late great mm -hmm. pal, and I keep make, mentioning late great pals because, you know, one can't be in the room without, you know, standing mm -hmm. on the shoulders of giants and, and, and rubbing yeah. shoulders with brothers who've now fallen. So, Steve, in terms of looking ahead, um, you're still touring with Foxtrot. I think you're going to mainland Europe with that. You've got the seconds out, US leg yep. as well. So still doing that. So your, your schedule for 2023 okay. already looks yep. pretty packed. Um, what about the writing and recording side? Have you got anything lined up? Uh, yes, I do. I've got, um, I've got two or three songs uh, done, one of which is quite long. It may even get longer. Who knows? You know, we, <laughs> we might have another Supper's Ready there by the time we finish. But whether people are still in the same position that they were, you know, people that were locked away in schools and said that, you know, Genesis was a, was a, a safety valve for them or it was, yeah. you know, part of yeah. 
one's dream life. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't know whether I have an audience that's that young to be able to absorb that. So I've tended to do shorter tunes, mm -hmm. um, but I do make albums rather than a collection of songs that are all potential hit singles. I don't believe that that is really a course of action that is open to me at this yeah. moment in time. So is this a rock album then or a classical album? Uh, this is a rock album. Okay. Um, I mean, I think at this point in life, the only way I'm probably going to have a, a, another hit single is if I go and form a band with um, Bob Dylan and, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and Eric Clapton and, and, and uh, you know, and I'll make the tea. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you can have that sort of the traveling Wilburys yeah. effect and yeah. all of that, you know, that although it was very low key, it was still corporate mm -hmm. in in its you know, I suspect driven by the guys themselves rather than the idea of um, uh, uh, I, I can't imagine that that came out of a boardroom. Yeah. Um, but it, but the album, Steve, we were talking about is 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 there, is there a theme to that album or have you? Just yeah, there there is, a, there is a theme. There is a theme. Are you I, able I, to I, share that with us? Or? Well, I we we. Batting this concept backwards and forwards the whole time, so we're hoping that it'll have a theme, but that it also parallels one's own life at the same time. Oh, okay. So that sounds um, interesting. So that there might be some kind of parallel myth or story going on that we can, but we have to go further to see whether that'll hang because they nice. have to work as separate songs. I think. Um, you know, possibly the greatest um, concept album of all time is Sgt. Pepper. Um, but I think that's because the concept was was so loose. The idea of them being different people and, and lots of third person stuff yeah. going on. Um, whereas they'd been very much direct first person. I, she loves you, I, she, it, yes, blah, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, suddenly it's he, they, etc. Um, I, I think that that worked very well. And of course, the fact that you could down tools for a few bars and the orchestra take over, <laughs> even if it's only in pastiche form, I think that it's extremely clever. And I think that ELO did something, you know, com yeah. comparable with, with um, the use of the Hollywood choir wafting in from time to time and you knew yeah. that you couldn't take it seriously <laughs> but and nonetheless it was like a like a very good poem in a way <laughs> so, so new, new album being worked on um, what's next from a Genesis Revisited point of view have you got any plans for a nursery crime or something like that or not um, well I don't know whether there's another Genesis Revisited album in me um, I would have to choose things that are non-favourites and all the songs that maybe hadn't quite come up to scratch um, turn them into, you know, glorious things. That The songs that were more sketchy, perhaps all those Cinderella songs mm -hmm. would be the ones that would deserve to go to the ball if it had a sufficiently uh, a designer gown or two, do you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. you know, the, the approach that I had to for Absent Friends when I redid it with Colin Blunstone and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra yeah. uh, was the idea of, oh, let's give it orchestral clothes, let's yeah. dress these old ladies up in, in a way that... Um, and I completely took liberty with the song because it was largely mine. Um, and um, I can well imagine people turning around saying, well, actually, I prefer the uh, you know the simple thing with just the, the, the two 12 strings and a bit of electric piano, etc., etc." And I can understand if someone says that, that's absolutely fine. It's like Dylan, the birds, or yes, Peter, Paul, yeah, and Mary. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, what's the sketch and what's the portrait, and <laughs> and at what point uh, do you stop? But in addition to whether there would be another, yet another, one of those things, um, um, from a touring point of view, from a touring point of view. Um, I may have, I don't know, I don't know if there's another complete Genesis album that is worthy of um, doing 
in its entirety. Well, we could debate that one. We could debate that <laughs> one, and, and I'm anxious to hear your... I think you should start that debate immediately and tell me what you think. Well, I love Nursery Crime. Right. As an album. Okay. Um, obviously, there were some songs in, some songs in particular yeah. that I would single out, Phantom of Samarsis. Yeah. Um, Musical Box, of course, that's been done. Yeah. A lot. Um, Wind and Wuthering is a favourite of mine. So for me, I think both those both those albums played end to end. Yeah, I think you'd be selling out the same way you're selling out with Foxtrot. Right. Yes. Is it, is it, but that's a that's a personal view, obviously. And then I would have to sort of wade through the Harold the barrels, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. So so. And how do you make that? How do you make that work? You I'm know? sure. I'm sure Nad could make that work. Well, yes, but how do you make it work? Um, how do you make it work um, instrumentally? What, uh, what's what's the new spin? Well, you, you you're asking the that? wrong person on that one. I'm uh, afraid. I, I, uh, maybe I, it's maybe it has to go a bit more trad jazz or something like that. I don't know. This, well, let, let's stick with Wind and Wuthering then, because you've yeah, done most yeah. of that already. I have done most of Wind and Wuthering. Yeah, I think that that's possibly um, stronger in its entirety. I would agree with that. Yeah. But but again, that, that's I have done it, and I've done Wuthering Nights, and so um, whether or not that would you know uh, bring them up, or, or 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 whether it would be better to have uh, you know a, a selection of yeah moments yeah. that that people think are but but it's are, funny are the best. But it, it's funny, Steve, because I mean, obviously, as Genesis fans, we love mm. the fact you're doing some of the Genesis classics and you're putting yes. your own stamp on them, as we were discussed, but. There's an element of me that mm. does get a little frustrated because, yeah. you know, with something like, for example, the Foxtrot, you had the yeah. Hackett Highlights, yeah, very much your big numbers, um, but very little from your recent run of albums. Right, yes. Because you can't yes. fit them in. Yes. So in a sense, yes. the success of the Genesis Revisited yes. has squeezed out yes. some of the recent solo stuff, which is some of the strongest. So yeah, well, perhaps, you see, excuse me, uh, so many things are un, are untested now, you know. For instance, this little old, old album here, for me, the um, bah, 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 surrender of silence. Now, for me, the flag, flagship track was and is Natalia, because which I've not heard you play. You've only played two tracks from this album. No, live. I've not played it live, and um, I'm saying it's it's because. You know, we had symphonic proportions plus mm -hmm. on that. Yes. I mean, it's it's like orchestra plus yep. film soundtrack. That's meets, true. Meets this, meets that, meets rock, etc. Um, uh, if I could do something like that, and I would, I know that I have to twist uh, Roger's arm because he says. He doesn't really want to do anything that he can't actually play. So, as opposed to the back mind, of the tapes, mind you, when he, when he, um, you know, when you set him a task like that, uh, he invariably um, does something quite extraordinary. So, so Roger, if you're listening to this, mm. there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so there's that, and there's relaxation music for sharks. Yeah. Which is an instrumental, but it's it's basically basically orchestral. It's really a film. Um, I haven't done the film for it yet, but um, maybe there will be at some point. You know, there um, you go. Um, and so you know, I go back to those things. What else? I mean, sometimes you know, when we're playing the album, and it's just playing between between the two sets, and I'm hearing something like, I think, oh, that sounds good. What's that one? That's Scorched Earth. That sounds pretty good too. Yeah, you know, um, um, I just don't know because people haven't had the familiarity of that, whereas they were familiar with the other stuff. Devil's Cathedral goes down very well. Well, it's, it's because an, it's an all-out thrash. Really. I mean, it really is a kind of you have to start with the organ. It's just kind yeah. of whoa. It works theatrically. It does work, and theatrically. it's it's always completely improvised. Um, what Robin and Roger play together. It's completely improvised. All that's agreed is that um, that they play octatonics or diminished runs or something close, and 
they follow each other they listen to each okay. other they, they okay. respond to each other's dynamics and and it's it's like a new kind of jazz because you get the sacred yeah, instrument yeah, the, yeah. You know, the, the sacred organ and uh, and the profane sax and they're they're working together it's it's what classical music should evolve to and it's what jazz should evolve to and it's what rock should evolve to but it takes intelligence and panache and all sorts of things and i let them do that on their own yeah i don't have the whole band doing that so no those twin colors complement each other yeah i think and it can be rasping or it can be very you know restrained and um Oh, I, I, I wish I had enough words to describe what that does to me. But um, all I did was set it in motion because I heard them messing around with something one day. And they said, what are you doing? You know, how are you doing that? And um, and they said, oh, it's just blah, 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 blah. It's, it's only this. I said, never mind only this. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's run record it. it. Let's, yeah. let's run with it. Yeah. Let's get you guys doing this. Yeah. And again, here's me as proud midwife. Yeah. To a moment that might never have happened yeah the rest of the song yes i'm writing yeah. but you know that and it's and in a way it's got a link to genesis i was thinking of some of the moments of dancing with the moon at night that take off like a rocket and i thought if we can do something that takes off like a rocket and a story yeah um it's in a Genesis tradition in the best sense that mm -hmm. it, there's a protagonist, it's a story, it's about something, it's about ambition, it's Alfred Hitchcock meets, <laughs> uh, yes, it meets a bit of a bit of blues, but a bit of jazz, yeah, a bit of it's uh, got gothic, everything, gothic. Isn't it? absolutely, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's it. The idea of if it has everything, it, it yeah. has everything but romance. <laughs> it's, this interview with Steve Hackett is brought to you by Make a Difference with Records. We are a vinyl charity store based in Godalming, and we support the Surrey Mental Health charity Catalyst. Look out for our other podcasts, and you can follow us on Instagram under Make a Difference with Records, or on Twitter at Vinyl for Charity.